with the past reversing this trend of the past century. A return to the 19th century seems to be on its way. Hence, two questions. The first, how to understand such a great reversal, as brutal as had been the, great, the preceding great transformation described by Karl Polanyi. Tax issues reflect this reversal. The productivity of the income tax decreased everywhere, regardless of ideological complexions of the current mounting power. In Sweden, the top marginal rate decreased from 85% in 1979 to 50% in 1983. In Britain, it went from 83% in 1977, the year of turning Scotland death, to 40% in 1999, while the standard rate in this country declined from 35 to 23. By the early 21st century, there was no developed country with a marginal rate above 50%. The change was teaching as spectacular as had been the growth of such rates between the creation of progressive income taxation at the beginning of the 20th century, starting with top marginal rates between <coughs> 2 and 5 percent, which arrived in the US at a maximum of 94 percent 20 years later. The second question is how to understand that such inequalities are almost everywhere criticized in general when the mechanism producing them seems to be paradoxically tolerated. <coughs> For example, traders' bonuses or CEOs' pay are almost everywhere denounced, but not the equivalent income and sometimes much higher in sports or in show business. There are key questions for our time. Key question because it endangers democracies. Democracy is manifesting its vitality as a regime, even as it refers as a social form. Political citizenship has almost everywhere progressed, while social citizenship has regressed. This rending of democracy is a major phenomenon of our time and an ominous threat to our well-being being. If it continues, the democratic regime itself might ultimately be in danger, and the rise of the populist movement is at once, in Europe at least, is at once an index of this distress and its driving force. To understand the present great reversal we must start by understanding the preceding great transformation. Three factors can explain the rupture with 19th century capitalism. First, the development of a reformism of fear. Second, the effect of the two world wars. And third point, the moral and sociological transformation having produced a de-individualization of the world. To we'll start with the reformism of fear, the development of the workers' movement and its traduction in terms of socialist votes with the universalization of suffrage at the end of the 19th century put a pressure on conservative government. We must choose between a fiscal revolution and a social revolution, said the famous French Republican. And from this regard, the German example is probably the most salient. For Bismarck, the reformist option was clearly a political calculation. Its immediate purpose was to counter the spread of socialist ideas by showing government concern for the working classes. In Germany, in other words, the plan to reduce social inequalities and compensate for the vicissitudes of working class employment stemmed from what we might call the reformism of fear. 
I took the imprint of an expression from Judith Schlaub, as you know, she spoke of the liberalism of fear. And I think there is a, in history, the equivalent as a reformism of fear. Most of uh, European countries followed the German lead. The trend received a boost from the growing power of socialist parties at the ballot box, which reform, for it clearly helped to limit social unrest, ultimately proved unable to reverse. Liberal and conservative thus resigned themselves to reform in response to alarmist warnings that capitalist society as it had developed by the mid-19th century, was untenable. Too much inequality of wealth and income, too much class warfare will eventually undermine every political system. It was a view expressed by the German economist and sociologist who signed the Eisenach Manifesto at the end of the 19th century, thus providing an intellectual and moral framework to justify the shift <coughs> in Bismarck domestic policies. Revolution can always be avoided by opportune reform, observed Gustav Müller, one of the people who wrote a lot of sociological research in Germany at the end of the 19th century. After 1918, a reawakened fear of revolution as a change in Europe. The October Revolution raises the specter of insurrection almost everywhere. In 1990, Europe witnessed a number of revolutionary uprisings spurred by the Soviet ideal. It was a fascist in Germany. In Hungary, Bedakun proclaimed the Hungarian Soviet Republic. And almost everywhere, large strikes erupted shaking established government. All of Europe is in a revolutionary state of mind. Lloyd George warned at the Peace Conference on March 1990. And he continued, the workers are deeply dissatisfied with pre-war conditions. They are full of anger and outrage. The whole existing social, political, and economic order is being, is being challenged by the masses from one end of Europe to the other. Workers had greatly increased their influence, moreover, and were organized on a wide scale. Trade union membership skyrocketed in the immediate post war years, and the power of workers, therefore, had to be dealt with. All these social and political factors converge to encourage governments to extend and accelerate reforms initiated before the war. The second factor was what I could call the nationalization of social life through the world wars. The development of inequalities is closely related to the detachment of certain individuals from the common run of mankind and to the legitimation of their right to distinguish themselves and separate themselves from others. It is therefore linked by construction with placing a higher value on private norm than on public norm. The experience of World War I reversed this tendency. In a sense, the war nationalized people's <coughs> lives. Private activities were largely shaped by collective constraints. Social relations, therefore, tended to become polarized between two extremes, either withdrawal into the family circle or absorption in the superior problem of the nation. Virtually, no middle ground remained between family and country. Concern with one's immediate family and anguish over the fate of one's country absorbed everyone's energy. Civil society shrank accordingly and was relegated to a position of secondary importance relative to both family and nation. 
the full simplification of social life and elevation of the nation to the status of a community undergoing an ordeal radically transform the condition of political life. The idea that every individual owes a social debt to the community gain currency. The fact that the war threatened everyone's existence revived the fundamental principle of the social state of nature. And the social state of nature seemed, in a way, quite real. The redistributive revolution thus stemmed from the context of World War I. Millions of deaths on the European continent compelled people to think in new ways about what united them. If the war didn't kill you, it made you think, as George Orwell put it. Of course, the soldier's lot was the hardest. Each combatant learned in the mud of the trenches that his life was just as vulnerable as that of his comrade, as all were returned to something resembling a kind of state of nature. Infantrymen experience the quality of conditions in the extreme form of a return to a state of nature at the border between humanity and animality, naked existence. Living in terror of death, they knew the equality of being cannon fodder. The consciousness of a community of nature gave rise to a very vivid and comforting sentiment of equality, one of them wrote. As a result of experiencing this kind of unity, they also constituted the nation in a novel and uh, immediately physical way. As Robert Musil remarked, many German soldiers felt for the first time the exciting sense of having something in common with all other Germans. One suddenly, he continued, became a simple, humble particle in an event that transcended the personal. Subsumed in the nation, one could almost feel it, he said. Death plus a queer meaning as a form of participation in the life of the community. The experience of uh, World War I thus marked a decisive turning point in democratic modernity. It was the idea of a society of semblable in a direct, palpable way. It revived the oldest and somehow forgotten meaning of the idea of equality captured by the Greek word homoioi. Homoioi defined in Greek the fact that you have a, a, a fight together and it's a notion of war, the homoioi. And World War I not only demonstrated this aspect of equality through the fraternal experience of combat, but also publicly validated it in all combatant countries through the organization of national funerals to honor the unknown soldier fallen on the field of battle. The cult of the unknown soldier was carefully staged to heighten its symbolic significance, attesting to the importance bestowed on the humblest citizen as a representative of the entire nation. The anonymity of the unknown soldier expressed in exemplary fashion the idea of radical equality, of strictly equivalent value, the most obscure individual embody what was best in everyone and became the ultimate measure of the social order. In 1918, every man became the incarnation of the social individual. Fraternity in combat and the commemoration of sacrifice are complex phenomena 
but they help to pave the way to greater social solidarity. The benefits awarded to veterans led to a general reconsideration of social benefits and other redistributive transfer. America itself emerged from the war profoundly changed. The experience changed American attitudes toward taxation and redistribution. When the Revenue Act of 1917 was passed, there was talk of conscription of income and conscription of wealth at a time when young men were enlisting en masse. Let their dollars die for their country, too, one conservative congressman said. The call for fiscal patriotism helped to legitimate a progressive income tax in the US. And it is fair to say that after World War I, all the capitalist democracies reconsider their basic principle and institution. But the redistributive revolution was also a perhaps mainly and moral revolution, which made redistribution thinkable. In a word, redistribution became possible because the economy and society were de-individualized by figures who rejected all views of individual responsibility and talent. What ultimately emerged was a new vision of enterprise itself. A new understanding of, of the nature of society sent the way people thought about equality and solidarity in the late 19th century. The founding fathers of European sociology, Schaeffer in Germany, Hobson and Hobbes in England, Fouillet in France, all agreed that society was an organic world. And the new approach had a diffuse but significant impact on political culture and social philosophy. And for our purpose, it was perhaps more important in Britain, solidarist republicans in France. These various <coughs> political and intellectual movements converged in the late 19th century. All three reformulated the question of how society is constituted in very similar terms. The idea of a society composed of sovereign, self-sufficient individuals gave way to an approach based on interdependence. The isolated man does not exist, argued Léon Bourgeois, the author of Solidarity, a work that will guide a generation of French Republicans and radicals. And in England, similarly, Liberalism, the book published by Bowes, was a book in which he argued that every individual was constituted by the social atmosphere. In this new context, the notions of right and duty, merit and responsibility, autonomy and solidarity were completely redefined. Equality as redistribution not only became thinkable, it also became possible. First, the introduction of the progressive income tax and changes in the estate tax cannot be closely related to the were well, closely related to the growing idea that existed a social debt, that everybody was owing a debt to society. Every individual was owing something to the accumulating labor of all mankind. And the individual comes into the world with all sorts of obligations to society. In addition to paying the social debt, there was also a structural reason for the redistributive principle underlying the progressive income tax. The tax made it possible to correct the income distribution determined by the market and first derived <coughs> from the principles of individual liberty and private party. By taking into account the social nature of modern production, as an example, Bob House mocked the claim of the self-made man to be solely responsible for his success. If he were to dig down to the foundation of his fortune, he wrote, he would find that it is society 
that defends and guarantees his possession and is a necessary partner in their creation. And similarly, in France, bourgeois, Sander the Pont recently, it is impossible, he wrote, that the society that defends, it is impossible to tally up each individual's account. And even the two great American theories of tax reform, Eli and Seligman, use the same argument in their brief in favor of a progressive income tax. They said there is no such thing as a strictly individualistic production of wealth in the modern world. This new way of looking, of looking at economy and society lay behind the progressive tax everywhere. The new tax was seen as a necessary instrument of socialization, a corrective to the market bias in favor of privatization and individualization. In other words, social justice was no longer based on a moral imperative of charity. It was instead necessitated by the social structure itself. And the notion of solidarity in the social economic order, therefore, tended to overlap with the notion of citizenship in the political order. The idea of representative society also figured in the new conception of the nation that emerged. Instead of looking at the nation solely in terms of an inherited identity, people began to think of it as a construct to be achieved democratically. And the development of the welfare state and redistributive institutions was also abetted by the fact that the social nurture of inequality was increasingly recognized. People were more and more willing to see the organization of society rather than objective and justifiable individual differences as a structural cause of inequality. We could even speak at the end of the 19th century of a large movement almost in every country towards a kind of socialization of responsibility. The movement for a law against the accident of labor was defined as a process considering that you could no longer speak of individual responsibility. An accident was an objective fact. It was not due to human behavior. And if it is an industrial accident, you have to put in place some procedures in terms of socialization of responsibility. And what is insurance? Insurance is a system for insuring responsibility. Considering that the, the problems are objective facts and are not uh, an element from private behavior. And views of poverty also changed. And Britain set the tone in Europe from this point of view. After Tony, post-war neo fabians such as Crossland, Crossman, Roy Jenkins, theorized the need for greater equality and described poverty as a consequence of social dysfunction. And the history of the welfare state, finally, was also closely related to the dominant place of Canadian ideas in macroeconomics, with that concomitant emphasis on demand. To redistribute wealth was to contribute to growth. At the same time, a new post-liberal approach to the enterprise gained prominence. Writers such as Andrew Chonfield, John Kenneth Galbraith, and Peter Brucker exemplified the new approach to the firm. In modern capitalism, Schoenfield summed up a vast study of Europe and the United States by describing the modern private industrial firm as an organization that, I quote, sees itself as a permanent institution and trusted with functions that transcend the search for maximum profit and are at times even incompatible with the search for maximum profit, end of quote. Indeed, the corporation style 
he said, was more and more reminiscent of certain public institutions. Although competition had not disappeared, the large firm had emerged, he argued, owing to its ability to tame the market by virtue of its great size. In other words, big firms were no longer considered subject to disruptive short-term changes in the market. Indeed, all three authors agreed that the day of the market economy was over. It was also a big film in the book of Karl Rolani. The modern industrial system, Gabriel Trove, is no longer essentially a market system. It is planned in part by large firms and in part by the modern state. It must be planned because modern technology and organization can flourish only in a stable environment, a condition that the market cannot satisfy. In Goldbreath's view, modern firms have become relatively autonomous organizations, self-financed to a large degree. They have no need to rely on the stock exchange and have largely freed themselves from the power of shareholders who were content to receive, I quote, Galbraith, reasonable dividend. In the large modern firm, Galbraith concluded, power has passed ineluctably and irrevocably from the individual to the group, because the group alone has the description of what might be called the de-individualization of power and the socialization of responsibility. The advent of his impersonal power also reflected the fact that the success of the firm depended more on the quality of its organization and the pertinence of its management procedures than on the exceptional talent of that individual. It could therefore perform quite well enough for staff by perfectly ordinary people. For Galbraith, these changes meant that the role of the firm's CEO was reduced to that of just another cog in the machinery of organization. And it is the reason why also he considered that a maximum of relation between 1 and 20, between the earning of a normal worker, let's say, and the pay for a CEO. And he even said that CEO was totally interchangeable. I quote, the retirement, death of replacement of a captain of industry, no matter how important, has not the slightest effect on general models or continental can. The CEO of a large corporation was for him forgotten as soon as he leave his job. And all that lies away for him is the obscurity of the sticks, he said. Executives, like other employees, had become organization men. They were mere servants. Prestige belonged to the organization, not its member. Galbraith and Drucker were by no means original in describing the evolution of the firm. Although they were not always clear about which part of their description <coughs> were factual and which were speculative. The views they expressed were widely shared throughout the industrial world, and the egalitarian ethos of the period was closely related to this image of a profoundly socialized world. Understanding the great reversal comes from the understanding of his great transformation. Considering the political and historical factors of preceding great transformation, it is easy to understand that they are no longer working. After the fall of communism, there is no longer room for a reformism of fear. Social fears still exist, but they concern such things as violence, security, and terrorism. They appeal to an authoritarian state and not to a solidaristic one. Ecological threats, in a similar way, put a concern on the fate of future generations in a general and abstract way, 
not on matters of social co-distribution. On the other hand, Europe has been a peaceful continent since 1945, and there have no longer been radical shocks inducing the reformulation of the social contract. But there is even more important the impact of the transformation of capitalism and society. The capitalism that began to emerge in the 1980s differed from earlier forms of organized capitalism in two ways. First, its relation to the market changed, as did the role assigned to stockholders. Second, labor was organized in new way. For this organization, based on the mobilization of large masses of workers, gave way to a new emphasis on the creative abilities of individuals. What now counted was mainly the ability to respond to rapidly changing conditions. The old emphasis on workplace discipline receded. Labor thus became more singular for two reasons. First, the nature of production changed. New technologies of information and communication were themselves products of knowledge, and new technology incorporated scientific knowledge in essential way. Creativity first became the principal factor of a more diverse and product offering more varied. The mood of production of the new capitalism of singularity was shaped by the economy of permanent innovation. And we could say that we shift from a capitalism of organization to a capitalism of innovation. A lot of new works concerning the post-war period show very clearly that in fact, during the 30 years after the Second World War, there were no uh, very important innovation in, uh, in, in technology. And that is the reason why most of the companies, of the companies that existed in the 50s were still present about in the same way at the end of the 70s. But the main factor of change does not only come from capitalism, it comes from the metamorphosis of individualism. We could say that the, the old individualism at the time of the French Revolution was an individualism of universality. Revolutionary individualism does not refer to a social state or moral fact. The term does not appear in the revolutionary period. It describes the constitution of man as both legal subject, the bureau of rights granting freedom of thought and action properly, and autonomy, and a political subject sharing his sovereignty through exercise of the right to vote. The term, therefore, defines a way of making society a novel approach to creating a social and political order in place of the old corporatist and absolutist order. Revolutionary individualism was therefore intimately related to the idea of equality and recognition of human similarity. It characterized a rela relational form a type of social bond and not the condition of a single social atom taken in isolation. George Simmel used the phrase individualism of similarity to describe in general terms the tendency of European society in the 18th century. His point was that the aspiration to autonomy and liberty was intimately related to universalist egalitarian ethos. The individualist perspective, he argued, rested on the assumption that individuals free of social order, feathers would turn out to be essentially similar to one another. In this context, liberty and equality were overlapping values. Once imposed orders, <coughs> disciplines, and structure were removed, individuals would be able to assert themselves fully as human beings. Everyone would become a man to prove. And after, we saw at the beginning of the 19th century a kind of tension between this individualism of universality and an individualism of distinction. But this individualism of distinction 
was only concerning the very small population, the population of, of artists. The artist said, of course, we are similar to other individuals, but at the same time, we think that we have to be uh, singular. We have to uh, distinct ourselves from uh, the, the others. We have to stood apart from the supposedly gregarious masses, which are supposed also to be slaves of immediate self-interest and unreflective passion. And this individualism of distinction that was a characteristic in the 19th century of some artists became today was democratized, democratized in some way. We could say that today everybody wants to be similar and everybody at the same time wants to shape his personal history and to have a personal condition. A very clear sign of his evolution is the fact that the nature of inequality has also changed. All four inequalities between different social groups remain, rich and poor, management and workers and so on, they have to a certain extent also become individualized. And this changes the way in which they are perceived. Inequalities are now as much the result of individual situations, which are becoming more diverse, as of social conditions. We could speak of inequalities of situation and not only of inequalities of conditions. And the individualism of singularity also reflects new democratic expectations. In democratic regimes associated with the individualism of universality, universal suffrage meant that each individual had a claim to the same share of sovereignty as every other individual. But today, this share of uh, a part is different. There is a need also to be regarded as somebody, as a person similar to the other, but also if there is a necessity to be recognized as being like other, there is a necessity also to be considered to be someone, not to be reduced to numbers. At the advent of what could be called the age of singularity, which is not only the age of individualism as a kind of atomism, because if you speak of individualism, you are not only to consider individualism with its difference, with holism, as sociology classically said, but to make a balance between those two ideas of individualism of similarity and individualism of singularity. And modernity is a mixture of the two kinds of individualism. And it uh, obliged this advent of the age of singularity to define in totally new terms the question of equality. Why? Because uh, we could say that today you have not only to, to consider that similarity like at the time of the revolution, but you have to consider how to produce regularity equality of singularities. And there are one central point. If you want to consider that equality has to be defined from the point of view of singularities, you have to return to the revolutionary vision of equality, not as a norm of distribution, but as a social relation. The central message of the founding fathers of the French and American revolution is that equality is a social relation. Equality is not a norm of redistribution. Equality defines the principle of similarity, the principle of autonomy, and the principle of citizenship. <laughs> and the problem is that if you define equality only from the point of view of redistribution, you need to base this uh, principle of redistribution upon a definition of society as a society of equals. And the very notion of society of equals was absorbed in the end of the 19th century in the definition of an organic society. And the organic vision 
displaced in some way the very uh, revolutionary definition of uh, equality as a social relation. And that is quite a key point in the discussion about equality today, is the necessity to make a clear distinction between theories of justice and philosophy of equality. For the last, uh, let's say, 30 years since the publication of Rawls, all discussions about equality have in some way stopped. All discussions have been about justice. And uh, what is the dis uh, discussion about justice? It's a discussion about the good norms of inequalities. What are the tolerable inequalities between individuals? Of course, there are many ways to consider the uh, false inequalities. There are many ways to consider what is a just inequality between a horse, a chairweed working, a donut working, and a horse, and a Michael Walser, and many other. But all of them consider that the true central point of political and moral philosophy is about distributive justice. When uh, I consider that the problem of theories of justice is that at the end, they don't say nothing about the nature of a democratic society. Because justice is not, uh, uh, is not only a problem of distribution. Justice uh, has to be also considered as a principle for building a democratic society. And if more distribution is clearly needed today, it has to be relegitimated. And you can't relegitimate uh, redistribution if you don't start from the very value of, uh, of equality as a social relation and not as an arithmetic mission. It is a very comprehensive notion of equality, which has uh, to be considered as a way of making society, of producing and living in common. You could say that if we want to translate the old revolutionary ideals, we would say that today, of course, the very notion of similarity remains central, but also to uh, take into account this notion of singularity. And in some ways, the very definition of discrimination. A discrimination is at the same time an insult to similarity and an insult to singularity. To be discriminated in some way means that you are not recognized as one among the others. And discrimination at the same time means that you are not recognized through your singularity. So it remains very central. But the notion of autonomy that has been central in the American and French Revolution has now to be displaced. And I think that the basic concept that could replace in some way is the notion of autonomy understood as the capacity for a worker to exist as a working on his own is a notion of reciprocity. The notion of reciprocity today is becoming absolutely central. You can engage yourself in society if you recognize that the others are also engaged in the same way. And when you see that there is a a decline in trust. The decline in trust becomes mainly from the fact that there is a sense of uh, uh, destruction of reciprocity in society. It is not only a matter of uh, uh, disparition of homogeneity, but rather, I think, a disparition of reciprocity. And the third element of uh, uh, the revolutionary vision, that was citizenship, as now a new definition, as this new definition should be, I think, a vision of communality, commonality. That is to say that citizenship is a, a, a definition of equality in terms of participation. To be equal, so you have the definition of equality in terms of position, that is similarity of uh, singularity. You have a definition of equality in terms of interaction, that's the principle of reciprocity. And you have a definition of equality through uh, a principle of participation. 
it was classical, classical terms, it was citizenship. But we see that today it has to be enlarged in some way, this definition of uh, uh, citizenship, through a principle of commonality. Because the, what is at stake in our society is a multiplication of secession, of separatism, movement of ghettoization, of ghettoization. And those movements are destroying, in some way, the commonality. And inequality, uh, in economic terms, should be judged from the point of view of those principles. What is the good norm of economic equality? The good norm of economic equality or we can tolerate some inequality if they don't destroy reciprocity, if they don't destroy commonality, if they don't destroy similarity, if they don't destroy the capacity for everybody to develop uh, his uh, singularity. In some way that it was that was a very definition of equality that was uh, uh, sketched by uh, Condorcet. Condorcet said that uh, equality is a balance between uh, uh, social quality and uh, economic circumstances. But if we want to return to uh, higher <coughs> rates of uh, taxes, if we want to, to repair the welfare state, we shouldn't uh, think of it only in mechanical terms. We have to think of it in terms of rebuilding a society of equals. If uh, 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 the decline of uh, the legitimacy of taxation has been so deep in the 20 last years, it's mainly because of his uh, impression, of his feeling of uh, uh, belonging to the same world as divine. But this feeling was not a democratic feeling. It was a kind of uh, organic feeling. It was, uh, in the old sense of the term, it was produced by uh, elements of identity, belonging to a party, belonging to a union, to be a kind of member of a social body. When, in a modern society, we have to build uh, equality, not from the point of view of those old view of uh, solidarity, not from the point of view of those organic view of solidarity, but from the point of view of a democratic view of solidarity. And a democratic view of solidarity should be based on this very social definition of uh, equality. I think we are just at the beginning of uh, a key discussion upon those issues, because there is an alternative. Of course, the first alternative to such a vision is just to say that the society of uh, generalized competition is the good norm of society. The other vision is to say that we have different view of considering this uh, competition. After all, there could be a very progressive definition of equality of opportunity. Even if at the end, equality of opportunity uh, defines a kind of society into which uh, you legalize in some way differences. We must never forget that in the beginning of the 60s, the first book to uh, redefine the problem of meritocracy, Michael Jung's book, was about meritocracy, but meritocracy defined not as a new kind of uh, a social vision, but as a kind of a nightmare. Because uh, it said in a purely meritocratic society, once you are uh, arrived at a certain position, its position is due to your virtue or your, to your talent, and you can hope no change, absolutely no change. Or you can think also in the terms of the Saint Simonians, who said uh, to be to practice equality of opportunity, you have first to destroy family and second to destroy uh, inheritance. Because a true vision of uh, equality of opportunity means that you have to individualize in a very radical way in society. You have no equality of opportunity if you don't individualize society. And that is a key contradiction. And also, 
another alternative is the populist vision. The populist vision, and it was the case at the end of the 19th century, the populist vision said that the response to the social question is in the formation of a negative nation. The response to uh, the social question is redefining equality as a difference between nationals and the others. And that the uh, response to uh, uh, the search for equality is creating a society based on homogeneity, on identity, identity built by the past, and homogeneity in, uh, in a racist term, almost. It was the case at the end of the 19th century. From this point of view, history is very useful. Because at the moment of the first, of the first globalization, at the moment of the first globalization, the, you had all false uh, answers. And the populist pressure was very strong in Europe. But you had the alternative with social republicans and social democracy. And today, we see the return of the populist vision. But we don't see the reinvention of social democracy. But it is not a problem to return to social democracy. As uh, Tony Jones put it in his book, uh, Il Fersenand, uh, I think the problem is to redefine what is a society of, uh, of equals. So what I try to sketch very rapidly is a kind of a new program and not, uh, not yet a definitive uh, work. It's remains a work in progress, but I think that it's a very definition of your lectures to present a kind of working progress. Thank you.